we're if we're struggling with this a little bit, that maybe we're not as punk rock as we seem. I think that's it. I think he's I he's aging us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I walk. I think I think every day that I'm more punk rock than I seem. So I don't know if I can follow this. Hi, this is Nathan. This is Nick. This is David, and you're listening to the Boss Podcast. Today we are discussing Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita. Yeah, and so this book, which is Satan Returning to Moscow, and it's essentially a, a sweeping satire of religion, the Soviet Union, and kind of everything in between. And uh, I guess just to get started, I, I think the thing that we all just want to talk about the most is kind of how batshit crazy this book is, a lot. Uh, we had talked about uh, Heart of a Dog previously, and that had had some things that maybe were ludicrous or maybe weren't ludicrous, but uh, Master and Margarita is really a combination of kind of everything from mystical elements to satanic elements to things in the Soviet Union that uh, are actually maybe have happened and pretty realistic, and Bulgakov needed to kind of, kind of gripe about those. So I guess to start off, uh, in the range of literature and sort of your expectations of, of what Russian literature is and kind of the storied tradition there, how does this line up with what your expectations were? When you see this book on a list of like great novels of the 20th century and you, you know it's a Russian novel, or at least in my mind, I think you know it's going to be serious, it's going to be morose, it's going to be philosophical in the way that Dostoevsky or Chekhov or something is more straight-laced and intense. And that went out the window when we read Heart of a Dog last time. And Master of the Margarita just, yeah, as you said, amped up the absurdity and batshit craziness to a level that I, I found very enjoyable. It reminded me a bit of uh, Flann O'Brien, like the third policeman. Oh, uh, yeah. I can see that. Lots of kind of... Vaguely, is this a dream state? Is this really happening? Is it sort of a blend of the two? All sorts of, I don't know, just comedic absurdities. Yeah, a lot of slapstick humor, a lot of absurd humor. But, again, more directed politically, I think. You say this is more directed politically? or The humor, I, the humor I th well, yeah, more than you would think of, like, Kafka absurdity or the Flan O'Brien or whatever. I was, I'm trying to think about how to respond to the, the Russian literature question because I feel like I'm probably the least read of the Russian canon of all of us. And I don't, I don't really know how to field that question. Okay. I mean, then fucking skip it, man. Talk about <laughs> the... <laughs> just talk about the absurdity and whether you're not... Because you seem more than at least Nick and I to have a gripe about how useful it is or how well it's maintained over 400 pages. Yeah. I can appreciate a good absurdity. I felt like uh, this novel kind of continually unraveled, and it just it didn't hold together enough for me. Like, it was just kind of absurdity for absurdity. And I, I think that there's something interesting about that and maybe maybe this ties into Bulgakov and his position and his the fact that he was dying and the fact that he burned this manuscript and his frustrations and it, it seemed like a desperate frustrated book to me in which he wasn't even trying to make sense of anything anymore. So do you feel like because uh, it was mentioned that this was edited right up until he died so do you feel like this was going to get tucked in uh, eventually, and he just didn't get a chance, or do you f actually feel maybe the opposite, where this thing was just kind of an ever-increasing, growing uh, combination of these things that were just kind of eating away at Bulgakov, and uh, maybe if he had lived a little bit longer, this would have even been broader and 600 pages and extra crazy. Like, where do you feel on that level? That's I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I, I feel like it. I think it definitely could have benefited from being tucked up. I, I feel like there's a... I, it, it seems arrogant to say, but I feel like there's a really great story in here that never got made. Uh, that, that there's just too much raw material, and it, the, the excesses never got trimmed in order to make it uh, a compelling story. Um, on, the, on the other hand, it, it could be that Bulgakov in his situation in the Soviet Union and 
his frustrations with the literary process there, that maybe this was just, you know, one his like ultimate middle finger at the establishment. And if he could have continued to write madness, he would have written more madness until he finally died. It seems like that's what actually happened. He just kept working on this until he died, right? But was he working expanding it, or was he working with the idea of refining it and never got around to refining it? Because the book, to me, it just it just expands and expands and expands. And then when it finally comes to the final chapters where it's reaching some kind of conclusion, that I, I thought the most compelling passages in the book were in the last few chapters, uh, but at the same time, the, the attempt to conclude the plot and conclude the characters felt really sloppy to me it, and really unsatisfying. Just as on basic plot level, it felt like things weren't tied together for you? Or uh, well, that, give me an example. Like, what do you what do you mean? Uh, well, particularly uh, the investigation of Woland and the crew, where basically he goes through event by event and describes how it was a result of ventriloquism and hypnosis. In the epilogue. Uh, was that? Yeah, maybe that was the epilogue. Okay. And it was almost like it almost I, I would have almost have preferred if he didn't even attempt to to tie it together like that. Because it was almost insulting. It was like, basically, none of this really happened. See, to me, I, I, I felt like that at first, but then I was thinking about the question of why everything is so absurd and how connected it is to critiques of the Soviet Union. And I was thinking about the, the Pontius Pilate narrative thread that is the master's novel and how Pontius feels this connection to the Jesus character and yet does nothing but turn his back on him and sends him to his death. And the absurdity in the novel and all these things that are happening, it's almost as if the powers that be have changed the people so much that they can't even reconcile that there are things that they don't understand. And there there are these absurd occurrences, but they have to sort of rationalize and reason with them. And so at the end of the novel, it's like it's almost like a sort of mass ignorance of what is actually happening all around them. And to me, that's similar to what we've seen in Bulgakov's critique of the Soviet Union, that all these people just ignore what is happening around them and just look for the most simple and banal explanation so that they can carry on with their lives because to challenge absurdity would be difficult. Yeah, and I, th I think there's something in there where it's a critique against sort of the atheistic views of the Soviet Union and how intense those were and, and kind of that chapter that Nathan's talking about. And from a narrative standpoint, I actually totally agree. As I was reading it, I on one hand, I was actually really thankful that somebody was helping me remember all of these characters because it was like, I don't know, a <laughs> fucking thousand. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, I was like, man, this this sort of feels like a like a very traditional, like, okay, now it's this time to remind the reader what happened to all of the characters such that everyone knows how it's brought to fruition. But at the same time, I think there is that overarching, uh, let's show how... Uh, kind of absurd it is to take things that maybe were supernatural or not easy, ex easily explained and then give them a really cut and dry reason to them. Uh, and then if you just take a look at that, you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense, especially like some of the hypnotism. And there was one line about like, well, this could just simply be explained by the long distance hypnotism. And I feel like that was just like, well, Gawkoff just jabbing at some of the uh, horribly mundane explanations of stuff in the Soviet Union for things that uh, may not have been that simplified. Yeah, and I think what Nathan felt and what we all felt probably a little bit at first reading that is what you're reading is sort of the end of the magic of the novel, but it's also the end of magic in these characters' minds and how they see things. And it probably, the way it's written makes you feel kind of like, oh, this is an odd way to end the book, just this wrap-up of everything, but it, in a way, it's the way that a bureaucrat would tie things up ni ni nicely, you know, with those words like, oh, long-distance hypnotism, doom, end, end of case, right? So it has that feel. But do you think that it would have it would have benefited the novel if those explanations had been creative? I feel like by wrapping it up, you know, as a bureaucrat might, uh, it seemed a little lazy to me, or it just seemed like if he was making a statement about the bureaucracy of the Soviet Union, then he wasn't doing it for the sake of his uh, reader, uh, because the bureaucrats aren't going to read this. But he's saying, like, what he's telling us as a reader is, like, fuck the bureaucracy. But that's not, you know, as a reader, uh, that doesn't do very much for me. 
he could have done it in a way that I would have or the reader would have had enjoyed, I think. Well, now I think we're going to slip into some very dangerous territory when we talk about authorial intent and audience, you know. So it's kind of tricky as, you know, here we are nearly 100 years later after he was started working on this book. Yeah, I agree. I guess I just feel like basically I feel like the way he wrapped it up is clumsy. Yeah. I, I Whether he did it – I'm trying to explain like why he – or trying to explain to myself why he would have wrapped it up that way because I think it's badly done. And I, I think that in my view an, an explanation for what I feel like is a lot of clumsy execution and deus ex machina just like things resolve themselves – without, you know, with magic. The, the book is about magic. Things just resolve themselves magically. But not, not creatively, not cleverly, just magically. And whatever. It didn't do anything for me, but I, I didn't feel like it was all that creative either. Yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from, and I think I also harbor that, that same feeling. Uh, so uh, on that idea, I think somebody mentioned this thing of, like, tying it up all together and whether or not that was the right thing to do, creative or not creative. And I think that leads into sort of the main thing that I uh, really identified with this, and that's Bulgakov sort of picking at traditional uh, expectations for what good and evil is. And that's a real easy thing to get started with since Woland uh, and his crew uh, are traditionally uh, supposed to be evil, uh, representative of darkness, all of that great stuff. Uh, but in this case... Uh, they actually end up doing quite a lot of good throughout the progress of the novel. And I think uh, in going back to sort of what Nathan was talking about and our expectations and uh, things being uh, wrapped up in, in a certain way, I feel like so many different chunks of this novel uh, have a goal of doing things in a way that you're not expecting. And him trying to kind of feel that out, and I think ultimately... It's trying to show that all of these preconceived notions we have, either about how things work, about how, where authority lies, where uh, good and evil lies, religion, all these things are just pre-programmed into us, and he's really trying to kind of get at that and show that it's, it's basically just a structure that we're all comfortable with it. I, I think that you and I had a different take on uh, Woland and his crew. Because I, I didn't feel that it was an inversion of expectations, really. How so? Um, I mean, he was kind of a charming dude, but he was evil. I mean, they, they killed a bunch of people. They displaced a lot of people. Um, they acted nihilistically and apathetically. And they did good for the Master and Margarita, but not necessarily out of any sense of uh, goodwill, I think. What about... Let's talk about the moment where... Margarita has compassion on, they're at this tannic ball, and he has compassion on the woman, I think it's, is it Frida? Who yeah. uh, basically murdered an infant um, that I believe uh, was, kind of came to her under less than fortunate circumstances, and then was essentially eternally haunted by it. And so Woland ends up giving uh, Margarita an opportunity to uh, prove, to show how much compassion she really has, and when she kind of passes that test of compassion, then he allows Frida to uh, be removed from that essentially eternal doom. So where do you think that fits within the realm of um, him still being an evil dude? Uh, if I recall, he responded negatively towards her idea of compassion at first. But wasn't that like an intermediate test? in which he was testing her to determine if she really felt that way or if it was just sort of a face value Ooh. thing? I didn't read it as a test. I read it as them thinking that that was a weakness on her part and that this woman, Frida, was going to be dealt with no matter what. But, yeah, maybe it was a test now that I think about it. But So doesn't she ultimately get her sort of eternal doom? I keep saying that. That's cheesy. But... <laughs> Sort of that that gets removed, correct? <laughs> oh, actually, I, I mean, I feel like I need to go back and read this passage again because my my interpretation was more aligned with David, and I thought the test was that she ultimately forsook compassion, forsook, forsaked, gave up compassion, <laughs> 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 and, 
and that once she she dismissed the compassion, that was the test. Like they were testing, they're like, oh, is she showing compassion? That's if she shows compassion, she's not allowed to be the queen of darkness. Interesting. This is not how I read it at all. So let's okay, let's take let's take a different example of this. <laughs> how would you how would you argue the end fate of of Master and Margarita being reunited? Ah, this this is is interesting. I mean, he kills them. A so they die. That's not, you know, in, in a traditional sense, a, a good end for them. But this, I think this leads into the question of when, when Levi comes from heaven and tells Satan that God has asked that Satan give peace to the master. But not light. But not light. He cannot right. go to heaven, but he asks Satan to give him peace. What... What does that mean? What does it mean for Satan to give peace to somebody? Why did this master not deserve light? I think if you look at it religiously, it just means he is not allowed to enter the the realm of heaven, right? And he's more or less going to be going with Satan, with Woland, into hell or to eternal doom, as Nick <laughs> aptly put it. But... Uh, <laughs> Instead of suffering in hell and becoming part of Wolin's crew, because that's something too that shows that Wolin is not necessarily he, he's not an inversion of evil because the people that work for him are servants who are in hell. He's just using them. Like when they're traveling through the moonlight and their their bodies change to what they really are. His closest servant was like a knight from a long time ago who made a, a poorly formed joke that Satan did not like, so he punished him into servitude. But uh, I went off track there. I, th I think it's it's God is willing, because these people are good, but maybe not good enough to go into heaven, give them peace. So they're dead, and they won't suffer in hell. That's like the extent of peace. Mm, interesting. Okay, and I, I think, so already in talking about this, I think the, so the idea of inversion of evil versus sort of a blend of in-between, uh, I, I think that is something that's built into all of these things, that they are uh, nebulous enough that they can be looked at on both sides. And so if we're talking about how these actions of Wolin can be taken from two different angles, let's look at like traditional actions of God, right? getting down into massive floods and apocalyptic stuff and people turn into pillars of salt and, you know, all that fun stuff. Isn't that traditionally also up for interpretation? You know, to your point, Nick, uh, and uh, maybe more than an inversion, it's a humanist telling of Satan and a humanist telling of Jesus and God where there's, Satan's not pure evil. He's very much a human being. And, and and such capable of you know the complexity and nuances of human beings, right? And he kind of so he kind of brings both toward the center, and I think it's interesting in the way that 1930s Soviet Union struggles with both. And so kind of taking the first one, so uh, the story of Jesus written Jesus and Pontius Pilate, written by the Master, which is a sort of rejected by uh, the literary circles of Moscow due to the fact that it's it's really not mystical at all. So like the, the novel starts out with the idea of um, the poet composing something that was actually just relatively believable, I believe is the case, and where literary factions of, of Russia simply wanted something that just proved that it never happened, that he didn't exist, uh, so with Bulgakov bringing the humanistic element of the story of Pontius Pilate um, into kind of front and center, he's sort of addressing the fact that all of these hardline views against religion um, are ignoring some of kind of the basic things in between um, the nebulous uh, qualities about them. And so by making uh, Pontius Pilate and Jesus into very... Uh, kind of standard human figures, and then taking somebody on the other end who is supposed to be 100% traditionally evil and bringing him into sort of the middle territory as well and sort of amping up that, that mystical quality. He's taking these two different chunks 
and making them more digestible in different ways and merging them together, which from a narrative standpoint is sometimes it feels like a total mess. But after kind of looking at those parallels, I think I can kind of see uh, what his overall goal in, in putting these two together were. Yeah, like when the master grounds Jesus and Pontius Pilate's story in reality, it offends the well-maintained sense of reality that the Soviet Union is trying to to keep. And that in itself seems absurd. So Bulgakov is writing about the absurdity of of the world as it exists, I think, even though he's using all these mystical elements. The fact that it's so nebulous goes to the point where I think, and I guess it's a question I'll ask you guys, um, do you feel like he has a message at all, really? Like, I enjoyed reading the novel, and it is absurd, and I know Nathan had issues with this, but does it have a consistent religious message? Does it have consistent political message? Does Is there a message to this novel? I was going to say, that's, that's a question that I was asking myself kind of throughout the novel, and... and looking for an answer to it, I'm still wondering. <laughs> so uh, I do feel that there is a consistent message with this. And uh, yes, I think it, it does take a little bit of digging to get there. Um, but honestly, I feel like it is very similar to um, like 1984 by uh, George Orwell in that each side that comes into power will always be um, the new power that you're against. And so what I think that translates into in terms of Master and Margarita is that uh, everything will become distorted to a certain degree that it's easy to choose a side about, but is that really the previous intention or was that really the facts or were these things simply uh, morphed along and used for um, whatever purpose such that the end result is not really what was originally intended? And so I think that fits in politically, and you know, the goals of the Soviet Union are, are definitely an example of that um, in, in how Russia sort of shifted from uh, the pre-Soviet Union uh, peasant-based type of society into uh, what we had talked about with Heart of a Dog is, is were they really any better off under, under this regime, even though it was really trying in earnest to, to clean up a lot of these things. And I think... He's saying that a lot with, with religion in how we always have talked about uh, good versus evil in terms of God versus Satan, but then also in how a society would treat uh, sort of getting rid of religion as the next step. But maybe that thing has become the new, uh, you know, the new evil in that it's really sort of trying to simplify or block out some of the things that previously came with religion that were not really that much of a problem. So I think it's kind of a commentary on how whatever comes into power uh, is always going to be treated as the thing that people are going to continually you know, go against, and that sort of explains constant revolution, sort of explains constant tension in politics, constant tension between religion and secularism. So I think he's pulling a lot of that together. And whether or not that's tied together beautifully is is certainly up for debate. But I think that it's all in there. Hmm. So in this story, who who's in control? That, to me, and I don't want to jump on Nick's point here, but that is something that where I, I felt like was where I found the meaning is that nobody's in control as much as they think they are. Yes, I totally agree with that, and I, I do think that fits in with a lot of the, the political stuff as well, is that whenever there is a party or a movement in control, is it really in control, or is it really just based on the, the general cycle of people always needing to shift in some direction? It's really hard for me to read some of this book politically outside of the idea that those that speak the truth are punished for it because it sounds insane. That's just throughout the entire novel. Like anyone who comes across Woland, no one believes them. Even though it's the truth in this novel, they are punished as if they were insane. So the idea of like speaking truth to power maybe, but even that feels a bit of a stretch. You know, I have a hard time with that narrative also just because everybody who came in contact with Roland did go insane. It, they weren't just treated insane. They were insane. That's not entirely true. So not that this guy came into contact with Roland, but at the end it was like the manager of the restaurant 
who seeded uh, Behemoth <laughs> and the other guy, right? And then he realized who they were, and he could see what they were up to, and so he... he this he was the guy that looks like a pirate, right? Yeah, he gave him the utmost service, and then he went and packed up a couple of pieces of smoked fish and just got the hell out of there. And so, yeah. like, I feel, <laughs> I feel like, hey, that's that's a little bit kind of funny and kind of <laughs> uh, just wrapping it up, but also showing that uh, there is, you know, some some capability of progressing from that to sort of learning from the response to insanity. That all, these people actually are human; that they're not all just flipping out when they encounter this. That there is a, a logical way to approach it. And unfortunately, in this case, it was getting some smoked trout and hopping on a train. So in that case, then, is Woland the system of power that people are coming into contact with and going mad because they can't deal with it? Or is he the rebellious nature going against power? Uh, it's kind of weird because I think it's both. Hmm. So I think it's rebellious because it presents a different view of the dark side. And I think it is in power because of the way that um, a his his capabilities are, are so much beyond those of everyone else in Moscow. But b the point of how everyone who comes in contact with him sort of falls into insanity. So I think he's actually going in both directions, which I think also in my reading of it kind of fits into the nobody is easily categorized, and whoever is in power is maybe not in power and whatever revolutionary forces exist um, may not exist in the future because they will always be upturned by whatever's next. And sort of the maybe nobody's actually right and maybe nobody's actually wrong. I don't know exactly how this ties into what we're talking about, but I think it's related. My, my interpretation of the appearance of Woland in Moscow is... Sorry, what was I saying? Uh, Woland appearing... Ah, so... Voland and his crew appears in Moscow solely to have the Satan's ball, right? I mean, that that's why they're in Moscow, is for this party. And all these other things that happen are just kind of happenstance that he's there and he's doing his Satan thing. But he wouldn't be there if it wasn't for this ball. And he chose Moscow because Moscow, for some reason at this point in time, is the perfect place to bring all the demons together. And... I couldn't help but read that as some critique of Moscow in that saying maybe Moscow is a godless, soulless city that's ripe for the appearance of Satan. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, I think I think what Moscow wanted to be at, at that point in time actually was a godless, soulless city. And so is Bulgakov making the statement that once you have a godless, soulless populace that uh, that allows for greater evil? I think as a writer and an artist, he got really into the idea of fate and destiny and some of these greater forces. And I think this was sort of his way of showing uh, when an entire society sort of loses that, how they're missing some of the greater things. As he got older, and uh, we talked about in the previous podcast about some of his experience with um, uh, sort of wars and carnage and, and some of the... Uh, darker sides of mankind, that uh, the idea of fate and destiny became more prominent in his thoughts. And I think this is him addressing that where it has come to a broader degree with the entire society sort of giving up on those ideas. That's, that's, that draws me to the, the opening of the book when, the, uh, when Berlioz and the poet are sitting there talking with Woolen for the first time. There, No one really knows that he's the devil and he's having that conversation about humans and the control that they think they have over their lives. The, the, the way that you're sort of talking about Bulgakov, I'm wondering if, if he is struggling with the idea of, of giving up on control itself. And this goes back to what Nathan was talking about, with whether or not he thought this would actually be published in his lifetime, or if he just was just trying to let out some of this absurdity. Because he himself clearly had no control over his life and his writing and his publishing in his lifetime. Let me see if I can find the passage. So he's talking, and he's, he's asking them, you know, what makes you think, or what makes you think you have control? And the poet, whose name I can't pronounce, Bez, Bezdomni, the poet that goes insane, and says, man himself is in control. I'm sorry, replied the stranger in a soft voice, but in order to be in control, you have to have a definite plan for at least a reasonable period of time. 
So how, may I ask, can man be in control if he can't even draw up a plan for a ridiculously short period of time, say a thousand years, and is moreover unable to ensure his own safety for even the next day? And he kind of goes on to describe death and cancer and being cut open by a streetcar and how this little fact that you don't even know whether or not you're going to live or die tomorrow tells you you have no control of your life. Isn't that a critique more of human nature and the ideology that could lead to atheism than the current situation specifically? Like, I, I think it's not a statement about like now we can't control our lives because of the Soviet Union, but we can never control our lives. And the idea, that the misconception that we can is what leads to an ideology like the Soviet Union. I don't think it's one or the other. I think I think it's both. I think it's it's a it's a critique of of control in daily life, control in terms of the idea of like what like what Nick was talking about, this idea of fate and human agency. I was gonna say I think there's kind of that battle forever in humans wanting to uh, get more of that control for themselves, but also taking comfort in the fact that maybe somebody else has a has a bigger plan in progress. And uh, this, this kind of sets it up. And I also, just in you rereading that, I love that there's actually a lot of little foreshadowing uh, nuggets in there. And so the way he lists that out, obviously the getting run, in, run over by a streetcar thing happened pretty soon. But the cancer thing also happened to uh, another minor character in the novel. And so while I think all of us are kind of inclined to sort of label this work as maybe a kind of a freewheeling combination of things that seems messy at points. I think there's a lot of these little things that went back and maybe did a couple of rereads. We'd, we'd figure out that maybe Bulgakov kind of has a lot of this architected and mapped out and maybe didn't fully edit it to, to his, uh, his desired state. But um, I love like just the little things like that. That when you bring it back up, I'm like, oh, we already planned this thing 200 pages later, this early in the novel. So I'd like to segue that thought into the question of what is the appropriate way to read an unfinished work, or to read and to ultimately judge an unfinished work. I know for myself, I just I try to judge the text as its own little closed off unique system or unique universe. I, I, I try not to read too much into whether or not it's finished and just treat it as as a finished book. Does it work as a finished novel? So in terms of on my end, yeah, I think that's a, a good way of doing it as does this thing work by itself? Because you, you can really only speculate what it would have been. Uh, but I think I'm more okay with reading things where they have moments of greatness rather than reading things that are completely polished and the arc is perfect, the uh, things are bounded properly. I think as a reader, I've always landed on, like, holy shit, this page that he just did is magnificent, and I think I could read this 100 times and still be happy with it, rather than, uh, hey, is this is this sloppily thrown together? Is Is this kind of something that wasn't fully realized. And so I think I've always been uh, the person that has an easier time reading unfinished works. And I think a lot of other things that I'm into uh, oftentimes feel unfinished or chaotic in nature. And I, I think I'm okay with a lot of that being unresolved. So I'm personally kind of into it. And anything that gives a window into you know, a unique section in time or society I think is still immensely immensely valuable, and this is definitely one of those. I think it also helps that this book is funny. It's super funny. Yeah. I, I wonder if this is one of the things that tripped me up about the book, is I have a really hard time reading humor. But you're, but you're such a likable guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like, I would read passages, and I'm like, oh, I bet that's funny but not able to enjoy the humor. So I definitely hear you on that, and this is my, my high-level summary of this is that I think there's a lot of intelligent stuff in there, but it just it didn't resonate with me at an emotional level in the way that a lot of like traditionally literary approaches do. And I, it, by the way you're talking, it, it kind of sounds like that, but it's almost like I had to kind of segment it because I would have a couple passages that I would read that I... I 
would kind of actually laugh out loud at. And I think maybe it just caught me off guard. I, I don't really sit and like laugh a lot at novels. It's more of kind of like a smirk of like, oh, that's that's clever, that's witty. I see what he's doing here. Um, but some of the stuff that like Behemoth did and some of the other passages, I don't know. I think I I still have very much an appreciation for slapstick in me. And yes. This novel is just packed full of it. And the the scene where and I think it's also the slapstick mixed with the violently dark, which I appreciate quite a lot. And it was when uh, Behemoth beheaded the MC at the their uh, expose of black magic, and the crowd is screaming. Let me see. Tear off his head came a stern voice from the balcony. What did you say? What was that? Responding to the ugly suggestion, tear off his head. Now that's an idea. Behemoth, he screamed to the cat. Do it. Eins, zwei, drei. Then an incredible thing happened. The cat's black fur stood on end, and he let out a spine-tingling meow. Then he shrunk into a ball and like a panther lunged straight at Bengalski's chest, and from there leapt onto his head. With a low growl, the cat stuck his chubby paws into the MC's greasy hair, and with a savage howl, tore the head off its thick neck in two twists. The two and a half thousand people in the theater screamed in unison, Fountains of blood spurted from the severed arteries in the neck and poured down the MC shirt front and tail. I don't know. Maybe that's too dark, but I thought it was goddamn hysterical. <laughs> yeah, seriously, it's like it's like 1980s kind of horror comedy slasher stuff, only done like 50 years earlier in in a book that people consider to be classic literature. I think yeah. I would enjoy this book if it was made into like uh, an anime. Just I think super it's also gratuitous spurts of blood and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, so I'd like to talk about one of mine, which is actually not as morose as, okay. as much as I'm into that sort of stuff. But so one part that I remember reading this, it was like early in the morning, I was like drinking my coffee. And uh, so this is in the section of uh, Nikonor Ivanov's stream, and I'm going to slaughter some Russian names all throughout this, so apologies on that end. Um, but so this is the guy that uh, had his money that was turned into <laughs> foreign currency, and then he had hidden it in his, uh, I guess it was his drain pipe in his bathroom. Yeah. And so the authorities were tipped off, and then um, he uh, essentially was taken away for that. And so he has this dream that is um, kind of absurd. It's a little crazy, but I was reading some annotations on this type of thing, and apparently it was fairly common. Uh, so the dream is that people are essentially locked in a room and interrogated for uh, whether they, uh, their family members, or people they know are uh, holding on to foreign currency. Because essentially the, the, the currency in the country was just not stable, there was inflation, things like that. So people would try to uh, make sure that they had some other way of just having a stable source of wealth. But at the same time, everybody was self-policing. And so what, what the note was that um, there would be sort of an organization where people would be locked in a room and fed like salty snacks and things like that, such that they just became so uncomfortable they would confess. So that idea itself as something that happened in reality is kind of just next level kind of comical anyway. Um, just sort of this amplification of what happens in bureaucratic uh, just self-policing societies. But then I like this passage, so where the MC uh, is asking people, you know, is there any other uh, people that, are, that have currency on them? And then so I'll just read it. So, we're not speculators, shouted various offended parties from the floor, but it doesn't make any sense. I agree with you completely, said the actor firmly, actor in this case being the MC. Uh, and I ask you, what sort of things are planted on people? Babies, shouted someone from the floor. Absolutely right, affirmed the MC. Babies, anonymous letters, proclamations, time bombs, and a lot of other things. But $400 isn't one of them because nobody's that stupid. And so like, I remember just reading that. I was like, That's, that, that, that nailed it. Babies are totally things that are planted on people along with proclamations. <laughs> and time bombs. So, yeah. <laughs> and so I think he like he can lock into some of these just little tiny quips that uh, you know, if you're not like rolling around on the floor, it, it at least uh, is going to put some smirks on some people's faces. Yeah, you, you caught on to like the, the plays on language and the quips were, were really good. Nathan, do you have at least a, a kind of style of humor? I think I preferred the more insane, magical stuff with Behemoth. And... Um, I will say, I, I was looking for something specifically that Behemoth said or did, but in general, in the last uh, 
quarter of the book where I feel like he really became a more major character. I enjoyed pretty much whenever he said anything. Like the scene where they're playing chess. Yes, that was one I of the thought, best scenes. I loved that. Where he, he's winking at the chess piece so it'll <laughs> run away. And... Yeah, it's so stupid, but it, it, that, yeah. that, that did tickle me. <laughs> the chess piece changes its clothes, I believe, was part yeah. of it. Yeah, the, the king and the bishop switch clothes. Yeah, and I like how they all they all kind of tolerate Behemoth, but he like it still doesn't it still doesn't mute his his razzle dazzle activities. I feel like uh, Bulgakov must have lived with cats because even like the when Behemoth spoke or became a human, I, I felt like it was a very good uh, a very apt personification of the way that a cat would speak if it was a human being. I, I know in, in my edition there's an annotation to some endnotes in the back and it mentions that his wife introduced him to cats and he never lived without them the rest of his life. But I think Behemoth's absurdity escalates throughout the novel and by the end when he's carrying around a stove just out in the street, they they burst into the store and they're just eating people's food and setting things on fire. The madness is definitely ratcheted up there. Yeah. No, I, I like that section, and also I want to comment that we, we basically, I think, proved that Bulgakov was just an old cat lady, right? <laughs> so I, I like where that went. Uh, but yeah, so that, that scene where they're in that store, which is um, tying back to what the passage I was making. So that store is a foreign currency store where they're sort of uh, um, almost blocked from entering because... Uh, only people with foreign currency, which is essentially saying that only the most wealthy can enter the store to purchase things, uh, which is interesting that that existed within a uh, society that was supposed to be so flat. It. Do you know, I, I read a little bit about this store because that, that kind of confused me a little bit. These stores existed as an attempt to eradicate foreign currency in the Soviet Union. That, that's... Right. Yeah, so it was a different way of trying to pull the foreign currency out. Yeah. But it was always in exchange for luxury goods. So you can, it it's kind of seems flawed to start with, right? Yeah. So <laughs> your way of, of getting rid of foreign currency is encouraging people to have foreign currency. I think that's part of the absurdity he's pointing out. Yeah, and I love like, so Behemoth goes in there and is just full scale eating everything, knocking over huge pyramids of food and, and sort of... Um, ensuing a, a minor riot and but at the end he points out to everybody like when they're finally caught he points out to everyone how absurd it is that you know the foreigners are allowed to come in here and get all of the nice stuff with but when the common man really can't get anything and it turns out that one of the other people in the store latches on and sort of sort of carries that torch for him and behemoth at least i read it this way seemed like almost surprised that that it that it worked he was just trying to throw that out there as like as just an excuse of like, hey, here's here's why I did it. I'm going to do one more absurd thing at the end of a of a whole train of them. But then the fact that somebody actually picked that up and was like, no, that's actually totally right. This is this is this is just not the right way to be doing these things anyway. Uh, is sort of an extra way of taking that one step further of this store being crazy to start with. And then it turns out people in uh, Soviet Union maybe just didn't even think about it because they were just bludgeoned from all sides with uh, with these different absurdities and realities in life. Agreed. So I, I think another thing that I thought was cool was reading about how this novel had phrases that have sort of um, become so standard in Russian language that it's kind of uh, ascended a level of cultural familiarity. And so one of them, we had talked about like the burning of manuscripts, but there's the quote, the manuscripts don't burn, and apparently that's, that's a very recognizable thing. But there's some smaller ones that apparently have also kind of um, been picked up on, and I really like the second, I think it's second rate fresh, or second level yeah. fresh. Oh, yeah. Which is level essentially, yeah. is it second rate? Second grade? Second, second grade. grade. There it is. Um, so like I love that people are still using that to explain people trying to justify just poor food. They're like, oh, no, it's just second grade fresh. And so I, I think... <laughs> I like that probably, message. Yeah, too. yeah there's, there's probably things that we're kind of missing on that resonate so strongly with um, people in Russia 
uh, that they seem funny to us, but like they hit just a different level for them, and then that kind of uh, just finds its place in popular culture. And I think that's kind of a testament to how in tune uh, Bulgakov's gripe list actually was with things that everyone had to deal with, and how few people actually sort of were writing these things down and nailing them with such accuracy, such that uh, everyone sort of saw that and agreed with them. Maybe this can be a, a nice segue into the question that we raised in the last book of how specific is this novel to the Soviet Union? Myself, I feel, I, when I was reading it, I, I was thinking that it wasn't that specific, but now as we talk about it and all these specific critiques or whatever of, the, of society, it feels very specific. And if you didn't understand something about what life was like in the Soviet Union, even a little bit, a lot of these references would be lost completely. Yeah, I think there's certainly a collection of humorous references that is 100% tied to the Soviet Union, and you can read this book and glean those and still get a lot out of it. But I think some of the broader things, um, sort of the humanistic elements of power and what that means and good and evil, uh, I feel like aren't really tied to the Soviet Union whatsoever. And so there's different ways of kind of focusing on things. And I feel like if each time you sort of read this novel and focused on a different way, that it could feel extremely different. And I think the way that we've been talking about it actually kind of proves that to me because I think each of the three of us sort of had a different initial feeling. But then as we talk about it, we're kind of pulling each other into this sort of center space that involves everything. So I think the question of does it fit into the Soviet Union or does it require being set in the Soviet Union is parts of it absolutely, and then parts of it, no, I think they're universal enough to not rely on that. Yeah, I was going to say, reading it with the addition I have in the end notes, I gave up on checking those just because I felt like they were pulling me out of the fun of being sucked into this flowing, imaginative, mad dream. And just reading, oh, this is a reference to a... A, uh, a Russian poet, and he's making this joke at this guy's expense. It's like, yeah, that doesn't do nothing for me. I think I feel that way about a lot of annotated works, is that a lot of it's not very necessary when you're in the process of reading. Like, if, if you pick up on it, that's great. And if you get the joke, that's great. But if not, it still carries along very smoothly. And I think this, more than Heart of a Dog, doesn't require you to kind of be familiar with some of the critiques of Soviet bureaucracy. Yeah, I think those annotations, at least for me, I would I think I'm always interested in annotations. I'm like, give me give me all the information you have. I'll give it, just, just do it. But I would try to not read them immediately, such that I could still digest some of that flow. And I'm going to tie this into something from a while ago, but this type of discussion really feels like in the very early days of Boss when we, when we read the uh, um, the Nabokov book. Pale Fire. The Pale Fire, yeah. And we all tried to sit down and talk about it and we realized that nobody knew what to do and how to read a book where the book was in the annotations itself. <laughs> yeah, we all read a different section yeah. of the book. <laughs> and, and I love that that was, that was Nabokov's way of, of essentially kind of railing on criticism and how are you supposed to how are you supposed to read these things where the flow is is interrupted by just constant footnotes and things like that? And so I, I think that applying it back to the Master and Margarita is is kind of very accurate where you can get lost in the little details that are actually, in my opinion, still really interesting. Um, but then there's also kind of a more universal, broader narrative, which if you focus on that, um, very much kind of stands alone and flows by itself. You know, I mean, maybe that's, uh, I, I ended up, I, I didn't read the annotations as I was reading the book, and after I finished it, I went to the annotations to see if I could make heads or tails out of what I just read, because I didn't feel like it flowed, and I, I didn't know what the theme was, and I didn't know what the point was, and I thought, okay, maybe there's a clue in here, maybe there's something about this that's that I'm missing. So wait... Even though I, I agree in terms of like idea of message, but I felt like the narrative itself flowed quite well, especially early on in the book where each chapter ends and the next chapter picks up kind of almost in the same time. I don't know if you guys caught those transitions early in the novel from chapter to chapter where like it'll have like somebody's doing something at midnight and then 
to end the chapter, and the very beginning of the next chapter is like, and you know, at, at two minutes after midnight, just across the city over here, this person who knows this person is engaged in this activity. And I felt like early on, it, there, was, there was a very nice flow in terms of just being carried and swept along into all these different people's lives. Yeah, I think they're I think they're linked, and there's also a time aspect of it too, which I think if you go back and track it, it fits within kind of the Easter week time frame. You know, I think it goes from like Wednesday to Sunday, if that's the case, and then it's like you said, it's very, it doesn't seem like it, but it's very chronological. Yeah. And yeah. there's all this stuff happening in an order, and um, even though he pulls you in and out of it. Uh, if you kind of step back, you're like, oh, this is actually more organized than I expected it to be. And uh, yeah, I, I do think, like, there were a couple chapter transitions, and I, I love when he did this, but where it would, like, end, one chapter would end, end with a sentence, and then the next chapter would start with, like, the same sentence, or, like, yeah. the second half of that sentence. And that would, be, like, pull you in and out of the master's novel. And so, like, kind of that... Um, abstraction of, of, of narrative level. I, I liked how he tr transitioned in between those. I guess I felt like those transitions were, were rather superficial. Like, the words moved along from one passage to another, but, like, why did it jump from this section of Moscow to that section of Moscow? How are these people related? Why are these things happening? None of those answers satisfied me. Yeah, I will say that the number of events and people in Moscow, I think after a certain point, I didn't get as much out of it. So, like, I understand why some of them are necessary, but um, sort of going back to that late chapter that we talked about where everything is sort of reeled in and it's kind of like a grand summary, you sort of you sort of remembered how many of these little shenanigans he, he pieced together, and... I think initially they're very important for showing how Woland and his crew operated and some of the reactions of, of uh, society towards them. But after a while, I think it did seem just a little bit more slapstick-focused, a little bit more um, kind of gripe-focused. And so I, th I think I, I can agree with that sentiment a little bit. And this novel's a tricky bastard because even in this conversation we're having, I'm sliding back and forth between, like, you know, I just... I embraced the absurdity and I loved it, and it, I just kind of enjoyed e seeing each little little narrative arc carry itself through a tiny chapter and then pick up again a hundred pages later. And then when we talk about it a little bit more, I'm like, well, actually, maybe Nathan's right. Maybe this this thing is just a mess that was never edited properly. And I I felt like that, and I still feel like that. It's just up and down with this book where I can't I can't get a good grasp on how I feel about it. Just at a gut level. Yeah, I wonder if I'm just completely contradicting myself every three and a half minutes. It certainly <laughs> feels like we all are. <laughs> I think it was interesting to me because I felt like that so strongly and you guys feel like that so strongly and I've seen so many people include this on their list of books that they love. You know, I think you know, everybody talks about David Bowie and I found like a David Bowie um, favorite literature list and like Master and Margarita was on there. Uh, they talked about uh, it was like a Rolling Stones song uh, where uh, Sympathy for the Devil, where this was like uh, in there as a uh, as an influence. And I've seen it just on so many like countless kind of, I mean, either call them artists or celebrities or whatever. But so many people are like, man, I, I, I love this novel. And I think part of me is like, man, it's pretty cool, but I don't know if I'd ever really put this on a list of stuff that I so strongly identify with. You know, it's funny. I have the same feeling, and I, I can't make any specific references about where I've heard of this book. It just has this aura of, like, I want to associate with the culture that associates with this book. <laughs> and I, I can't even specifically identify where I've even picked that up. Uh, and for me, personally, I wonder if it's not the case of having discovered it at the wrong time. And for me, coming into it with a lot of expectations and feeling like, oh, this is kind of slapped together versus discovering it in a more maybe countercultural uh, environment and being like, wow, there's something here underneath all of this uh, messiness. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I definitely, like I always try to 
before these books that we read, I try to read a couple other things. And so I was reading like Brothers Karamazov and uh, just other very classic uh, Russian tomes. And then getting into this, I'm like, man, I was, I was just way off. And so like I, I wonder if some of my perception of it comes from some sort of expectation of what the Russian canon is and is supposed to be. Whereas if some of these other people were maybe just totally tired of that, and then when this came out, they're like, oh, this is, this is the thing. This, this fits with, with counterculture. This fits with uh, just doing whatever and not worrying about form or structure or expectations. So maybe, maybe it's kind of like pre-tainted in some way. Yeah, it'd be like listening to, you know, Sex Pistols and expecting Mozart. I gotta be honest, that that metaphor eludes me. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess was gonna say they sound similar to me, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, sorry, maybe a bad metaphor, but if you if you were if you wanted punk rock, then the attitude of it mattered more than the form of it. Yes. But if you li- if you look at it for the form, and you you're not into the attitude, then you're Missing the point, I guess. I think maybe, maybe that's where I feel. It's like I'm not, I the attitude of it. I'm not responding to the attitude of it, and I'm looking for kind of uh, some kind of form that I appreciate. Okay, I was gonna say that 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 metaphor is more apt. Being an ex-punk rocker myself, I I really maybe that's why I feel this pull because I love the energy that's in the novel, if not the execution. But even the execution, I, I still I like quite a bit. So. But wait, so but but Nathan's angle is suggesting that if we're if we're struggling with this a little bit, that maybe we're not as punk rock as we seem. I think that's it. I think he's I he's aging us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I walk. I think I think every day that I'm more punk rock than I seem. So I don't know if I can follow this. Yeah. I'm just saying that maybe I'm not as punk rock as I seem. That's impossible. <laughs> You know, I, maybe it's kind of like it's like reading uh, Catcher in the Rye at the wrong time, right? Because at a time, there's a right time to read Catcher in the Rye where it's like, oh yeah, I really tap into this kind of ca- countercultural mentality, and then there's a time to read it where you're like, this is kind of juvenile. I yeah, think. yeah, I'm with it's you. Not, not that this is juvenile. I mean, I think this is it's uh, it's, it's a totally different kind of work, obviously, than Catcher in the Rye, but I just feel like there's something that if I had read it, if I had discovered it, somebody had like handed me a Xerox copy of Master Margarita, and they're like, this is batshit crazy, you have to read this. Um, and I hadn't seen it on so many best hundred novels of the 20th century lists. Uh, I would come to it with different expectations and feel like I could appreciate it more as my discovery, you know, my diamond in the rough. Um, but having been given all these expectations for it, and reading it and thinking like, uh, but it's not finished is kind of how I feel about it. So when the novel ends, you don't you don't feel like prior to the epilogue, when the novel actually ends and the master has his piece and him and Margarita are off in their cabin somewhere, I felt like that was a good ending. Well, not that it's not that it didn't end. It I mean end. the ending was finished, but okay. the book itself, the editing and okay. the you know, figuring out what was actually important, how many of these vignettes needed to be included. Uh, I just, I, I, that part didn't, didn't feel finished to me. Yeah, I agree. I, I, there's certainly a few characters at the Variety Theater that really don't need their own storylines, but, but in the moment, I enjoyed them. I found it tedious. I mean, there's the other aspect of this of the names, which. It is exhausting to read Russian names. Uh, oh yeah, that's that's the battle forever. I mean, <laughs> you pick up any of these, and there's always you know there's three of them, and then they'll shift it around, and you got to track that too. And there's something about like just this sweeping long novel that that needs to have just oodles and oodles of of minor characters, and I know like each time. I look at those, and some of them start to blend together, like lots of names with starts with N and starts with I. And I was like, man, I can't tell these apart anymore. Yeah, the names 
and the shifting and how people can sometimes be called by their first, last, or middle name at any given time. Or nickname. Yeah. Which may or may not sound like any of their names. Yeah. Right. Well, I think there's also built into kind of individual interactions, and this is stuff that we probably just fully don't understand, is um, the use of different names when interacting with people of different social standings, right? And wow. I, don't, I don't know if that's fully the case, um, but I do think that there are some ways to address people more formally, more informally, uh, and then from a narrative standpoint, when it's necessary to use the full name versus, you know, kind of truncating that. So I think some of the different names come from the actual social requirement of how people talk to each other. And for us, we're just like, well, I, I don't really have that many names. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Nathan, so you, you were sort of the, the grumpy one on this throughout the podcast. Yeah. Uh, what, what overall was, was kind of your thoughts of this one? Um, I thought it was a mad, sloppy mess. Um, I thought at times the parade was enjoyable, and there's certainly memorable characters and humorous scenes. But on the whole, it never, it it, it did not pull itself together. Okay, David, what do you think? I I I found it to be a a beautiful mess, and much like much like a dream that I enjoyed being in. Where I was, I was confused about why things were happening, how things were happening. Um, I was also bored at points. So yeah, it was a a long, strange dream that I enjoyed being in. Uh, yeah, I, I guess in, in terms of my impression, I, I like that term, beautiful mess. So I think I have still found a lot of stuff in here that I really enjoyed, and I think when I look at it from different angles, sometimes I'm like, man, that doesn't go together at all. Uh, other times I'm like, man, he's weaving together things that are so far apart, but at the same time he is finding a common thread and there is some conceptual stuff that I, I feel is thematically uh, intertwined. Uh, but I think, I like Nathan's comment before about maybe not having read this at the right time or been in the right mindset, and that's kind of where it fits in for me. You know, I liked it and there's a, a ton of stuff in there. But it wasn't something that had like an emotional resonance. It's not something that if somebody asks me um, in conversation like how I felt about this, that I would just like instantly dump out a bunch of positive things, which I have uh, definitely the trend of doing with a lot of other novels that we've read. So uh, I liked it, but um, I think it might not uh, exist on any of my lists. No, I agree. I think I think much like. My ramblings throughout this podcast, I if people were to ask me about it, I would find ways to equivocate and with the exception here, 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 and here, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Woland or Satan or the devil is pure evil in the way that one might imagine. <laughs>